So we've had some fantastic input into our brains and eyes and ears this morning from, uh, from some, some really great speakers who are, uh, I think all of them, doing stuff we'd all love to be doing um, and creating avenues that uh, hopefully are going to help this whole um, re-energising re of local communities and, and, and local enterprises and social enterprises uh, as well. Um, we, we have the, in the remaining time, which is all of about 33 minutes now before we close today, um, the opportunity to have all our speakers uh, that are still with us um, come up and answer uh, uh, questions again. So I'm sure there may be some more boiling on. But before that, I just wanted to talk through a, a few little bits of background uh, about the Australian um, uh, context um, that, uh, that, as I said before, relates very closely to, to the United States context that Michael spoke about. Firstly, the regulatory, um, uh, the regulatory context. Uh, we do have pretty strong financial services regulation here in Australia. Um, uh, I, I worked in the financial services industry for nearly 30 years and was part of a lot of the industry consultation that went into some of the, the, the most recent changes that are now in, um, uh, found in our corporations law and, and other laws like that. Um, they, are, they are strong, they are to um, protect um, uh, Michael's grandma um, <laughs> um, from, from losing her, uh, all her worldly goods um, by investing in, in good companies. Uh, even though she can go to the casino and blow it all in one night. Um, and, uh, and, and they do have similar provisions, as I mentioned before, for, for what we call sophisticated investors or sometimes wholesale uh, is the word is used as well. Um, um, uh, of financial institutions themselves, there's fairly strong regulation. I know this firsthand because I was chairman of the board of a friendly society regulated by APRA and we were struggling to survive uh, and, and keep our, our, our margins above solvency levels and the like. And uh, APRA uh, uh, don't have much of a sense of humour, I've found, <laughs> when it comes to these sorts of things. Um, uh, in, the, um, in the lending sphere, we had each state, um, we had a lot of cowboy lending going on mortgage brokers and, and, uh, and, and mortgage originators and what have you. So there was a real need to, cl to clean up the lending situation in Australia and, and uh, we, we a, a few years back got a uniform credit legislation happening which was again stronger and there's still further work going on about licensing of, of uh, mortgage brokers and the like who are really giving financial advice without being licensed to do it as well. Um, like encouraging people to borrow so they could invest in you know, margin calls or, or shares or whatever. Now that is financial advice and some brokers were doing that without having the right necessarily competency or licence. Um, the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the company legislation does allow even a private company to raise uh, debt capital through, through debentures. Um, and, and notes, uh, and there's a bit of work and cost involved, of course, you need to appoint a trustee and all that sort of stuff, but, um, and, and you don't have to go to listing to be able to, to do that, um, and, and you can issue share capital out of a private company, um, but you just, as has been spoken about a lot today, you can't go and, and advertise that to the public, because then you're soliciting funds from the public, you can sell it to your family, friends, and. And, and get them to, to invest, you know, without uh, with it still remaining within the, you know, in, in the uh, sensible bits of the law. Uh, we've only got the Australian Stock Exchange and the um, I think it's called the National Stock Exchange now, which was built out of the old Bendigo Stock Exchange and the Newcastle Stock Exchange. We had two small um, regional stock exchanges. Uh, Michael, uh, in his book, and I, and I think he mentioned it this morning, that various states in the United States can have their own stock exchanges. We don't have that here. We've just got the one big behemoth of, a, of an exchange. Um, and uh, as I've mentioned, um, uh, provided you stay within the, in the limits of um, uh, Paul, it's uh, 20 investors, isn't it, and $2 million? Um, then you can uh, then, then you can raise and it's it's made the offer made is made privately, uh, not publicly advertised and the like to people you already know, which gets back to some of these investment circles, the investment opportunities networks and the like, as a as a good model that can amass those potential in investors. 
Now that's, that's a bit of the legislating uh, side of things. Um, we do have masses of small businesses already. Now most of them uh, are s a sole proprietor with no employees. Um, and beyond that there's small to medium enterprises. And you would think that most of those are local. Well, they're going to, um, you know, they're not going to be like a government department or something, which might source their stationery into from someone interstate or some multinational or what have you. They, they're more likely to be buying locally uh, because they're small. So our our small business sector is a very important sector because it's the one that's working in and with local communities, and and, and they're the ones that that banks like Bendigo are interested to support as well and can generate a 13% return out of um, that, that, that sort of banking activity within the local community, which is great. Um, and, and, and so, you know, we need to value those, those, those small businesses uh, and, uh, and nurture them and grow them and keep them local. Um, as Paul mentioned, for some of them, to grow means their end game is to sell out to a multinational <laughs> and that works against the localisation idea. So we need, we need to find ways also of making it more attractive for them and this comes into the partnership and cooperation stuff that Michael talks about, fight to find their way to find their, their end game, their exit strategy to be able to sell to another local invest, you know, business or investment syndicate or whatever it is to keep the business local. I'm sure Michael will have some ideas about that too. Self-managed super funds um, uh, are, are an interesting one. I've, I run one myself, I have done for 10 years, and it does enable you. You've still got to meet certain regulations. You can't lend money back to yourself or your family or do other similar things that, that, uh, that they specifically mention. But um, you do have greater freedom of, 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 of where you invest your money with the self-managed super funds. And it's the fastest growing sector in, in Australia. These are the statistics you're seeing here for it. Um, and uh, the interesting figure is that uh, there is $415 billion invested in, in these self-managed super funds, which have an average of about two members. Um, and with a self-managed super fund, each member has to be a trustee of the fund. So you can't have some remote um, decision maker making decisions. Every member who, who will have an account under that fund has to be part of the decision making process. Uh, they're regulated uh, by the tax office, not by, not by ASIC and, or APRA. Um, and, and the compliance is reasonably straightforward. Um, it's an account, a set of accounts and an audit each, each year will, will do it. Um, but the interesting thing, thing is 1.1% as at uh, uh, as at March 2002, was invested in unlisted companies. Now, most of those are probably going to be small private companies. Um, uh, and so that's already $4.56 billion that self-managed super funds are putting into local businesses. Now, if we grew that by another 1%, there's another $4.5 billion, roughly, to go into supporting the local economy. Um, as Paul has said, the business has got to have the right story, it's got to have the capabilities and the team, um, and, and not every one of them is going to succeed, but there's a risk in any investment that is made. And self-managed super funds uh, are, 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 I would put, almost at the top of the list of potential areas for investment in the local economy. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the regulations we do require, you know, uh, be, your, you, you have to submit an investment strategy each year for your, for your audit, and that has to meet the, the financial, the, the needs of funding retirement for whoever the members. So as you get closer to retirement, when your needs get uh, needs turn more to generating income rather than growing capital value, you need to adjust your, your, your uh, uh, investment strategy accordingly, and your auditor would pick that up if you have an investment strategy that's way out of whack with the ages and the years to retirement of your members as, as, as well. Um, but, uh, and look, some people have used self-managed super funds irresponsibly as a, as a way to try and sneak money out the back door and back your left pocket into the right pocket, as it were. Uh, and, and, and so um, there was al there's always a cons concern about self-managed funds being used inappropriately um, because 
naturally, the government provides Australia very good tax incentives to save for their retirement, and they want to make sure that's where the money is actually being directed to. Cooperatives, Michael mentioned, um, there are surprise, cooperatives and mutual uh, banks and mutual societies are a surprisingly large uh, part of our economy here in, in Australia. And we, they're also a great vehicle, as, as, as Michael mentioned, so I think you devote a whole chapter to this in, in the local book, Michael, don't you, that um, they can also borrow money, they can buy other businesses, they can lend money um, uh, as part of an investment strategy, they, they, and they can raise further money, as Michael has mentioned in one of his examples this morning. And funnily enough, New South Wales government um, was one of the first well, was the first and so far only state government that actually created an extra vehicle for, co for cooperatives to raise extra money. The people who provide the money have to become members and abide by the member rules still, so it's got to preserve the whole um, spirit and, and, uh, uh, and the, um, the ethos of, of cooperatives but they can raise as much money as they, as they like by attracting new members who are in effect, in effect going to provide further capital. And they're a great way through, uh, for local businesses to cooperate together, particularly through purchasing, getting purchasing power going. Um, how did IGA uh, get started, you know, a, a super fund chain? That was a, a bulk purchasing arrangement starting as a cooperative. Many and um, the, the head of the New South Wales Federation of Cooperative Association works for the Plumbers Supply Cooperative, and that's a large purchasing cooperative. But they can also be trading and running enterprises as, and social enterprises. So they're another great vehicle um, that uh, that that we and others can use uh, in building our the resilience of our local economies as well. And there's our good mate Peter Russell Clark. Haven't heard, haven't seen him on the television for quite some time yet. He was one of our early, how would you say, character chefs doing his cooking shows around the place. But he he's really making the point that Michael has 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 been pushing strongly for many years. Um, the money is disappearing out of our communities into into remote um, uh, uh, national and multinational companies uh, owned by a few. Um, or, or many, so um, we're not doing a real good job of, 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 of keeping the money in our communities, whereas cooperatives can help us do that. And finally, you know, there are all of these opportunities if we want to, if we want to seek them and, and use them. And we've heard of, of quite a few of them this morning. Um, so the, 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 the challenge now for us uh, to take away from today and, and back into our own, our own networks and our businesses and our, f and our further communication with each other is, you know, how can we work together to make it happen in, in our communities? How can we work with our local government economic development people, and we have a few here today, how can we work with financial um, uh, institutions and self-managed super funds and others like that to harness this money that is currently and I'm as guilty as anyone else, um, uh, even in my, uh, my self-managed super fund, that a lot of my money is going to, to shares of, 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 of multinationals uh, and, and others, which is not really um, walking the talk when it <laughs> comes to local investment. Um, so, so the money is there, um, the need is there, it just needs us to, um, to, to line up behind that and put our energy into it. And, and we can actually make a positive, uh, significant positive difference. There's Michael's three rules that he mentioned before, he put up on the slide and spoke to. Uh, there's his key questions, um, uh, the, the six P's as he calls them. And he uses that old line, give P's a chance. <laughs> um, and I'd like to uh, say now a great, a huge thank you in advance to, uh, to all of our speakers who still remain with us. We'll finish off today's uh, um, workshop um, with all your questions and hopefully they're hugely intelligent answers as well. 